West Coast of America was going through a cultural awakening in the 1960s and 70s. Prospects of fame and fortune arose in the entertainment industry, and concepts of free love and self-enlightenment through sheets and sheets of LSD made it the grooviest place to be. So it makes sense that so many teens hitched their way across America to partake in the movement, but it didn't really work out great for most of them. Some worse than others. 1978. Fifteen-year-old Mary Vincent was growing up fast. She was a tough, pretty, and independent young woman. The Vegas suburb that she had called home was the scene of her parents' very fresh divorce. She didn't think Nevada had anything for her anymore, so she skipped town. A lot of kids dream about running away to some idyllic place and starting fresh. And for her, the grass would be greener in California. She hitched a ride out to the Bay Area to start a new life. But the West Coast street life could be tough on a pretty 15-year-old girl who had nothing, no connections or money. She was not welcomed with open arms into any communal hippie utopia like she had imagined, but a much darker one dealing in exploitation and hard drugs. Disappointed and exhausted, she decided it was time to head back home. So she planned a route, 80 to Sacramento, down the 5 towards LA, and then jump on 15 into Nevada towards Vegas. Mary walked up to the highway that morning and joined two other hippies thumbing it out of town. Turned out they were headed the same way as she, so they could all hitch a ride together. A few minutes later, a van pulled up and offered a ride, but there was a catch. He told them that he only had room to take one hippie down the highway. Mary's new friend said they were catching some bad vibes and that she should wait, but Mary let her desperation get the best of her and she jumped in the van. Her good Samaritan was 51-year-old Lawrence Singleton, former merchant marine and the embodiment of evil. He told Mary that he needed to stop by his house in San Pablo first, but then he could take her as far as LA. She agreed, and after the errand, they jumped on the highway towards Interstate 5. If Mary was worried why the mostly empty passenger van could not fit the two other hippies going the same way as her, her mind was put to ease when they left Singleton's home. Tired and assured they were going the right direction, she let the highway rock her to sleep. Traffic noise or a bump in the road must have woke her because she sat up to see how much further they had and something seemed off. They had missed I-5 and they were going in the wrong direction. Mary wasn't going to put up with this and she demanded that he correct his route. He seemed genuine as he apologized and he told her that he had just not been paying attention. He pulled off at the next exit and got turned around. Mary knew something was off but she stayed calm. When Singleton told her he had to pull over to take a quick piss, she figured she could use some fresh air as well. Mary knew she may have to run if things got bad, and that's when she noticed that her shoes were untied. As she bent down to lace up, her world went dark. Larry Singleton had crept behind her and took a swing at her skull with a small sledgehammer. He dragged her into the back of his van and tied her hands behind her back. He tore her clothes away from her body, and he began to rape her as she came to. Mary had woken up in a very real nightmare, and things were only going to get worse. When he finished, he hopped back into the driver's seat and drove down the road to a more remote spot. That piece of shit kept Mary hogtied and captive in the van, raping her over and over throughout the night and into the next morning. When he was finally done using her, he had come to the realization that she could ID him, so she had to die. He re-entered the back of the van and then emerged with a hatchet. When he got back to Mary, he started hacking away at her left arm. She struggled, but after a good few swings, Mary fell to the ground as an amputee. Her hand was so tightly wrapped around his wrist while he attacked her that after he hacked it off, 
Mary watched him shake her severed arm loose before turning his attention back to her. He took longer on the right arm, but by the time he had taken that from her as well, she was done fighting. Lawrence mocked the plea she made to be set free throughout the night before tossing her off the side of the road down a 30-foot drop into a concrete drainage ditch. Larry Singleton got back in his van and drove home, leaving her for dead as if nothing had happened. But she wasn't dead. Mary stayed conscious throughout the attack despite the massive blood loss. She dug those bloody stumps into the mud to stop the bleeding and she started to crawl. It was a slow, arduous, painful movement, but she refused to die. By the time she made it back up to the highway, it was already nightfall. She gathered enough strength to stand and she began walking down the road, hoping to flag down the next passerby. But the first people to drive up on Mary were so horrified that they sped off. The next car to see Mary would pick her up. They quickly wrapped her stumps with towels that they had on hand, and they took off towards the nearest hospital. Mary would survive, although her life would never be the same. She was able to give an accurate description of Lawrence to the police sketch artist, and that monster was captured just two weeks later in Nevada after his neighbor recognized the sketch on the local news. When questioned, he claimed to have no memory of the attack because he was blackout drunk. But when the jury saw Mary in court and the photos of the aftermath, they didn't give a shit how drunk he was. They just knew he was guilty. The judge threw the book at him. The maximum sentence. Unfortunately, the state of California just didn't have a very big book at the time, and their maximum sentence was 14 years. On the way out of court, Lawrence Singleton leaned in towards Mary and vowed to finish the job he started. In 1982, Mary was awarded $13,000 by the state's Violent Crime Act to help her get back on her feet, which has to be pretty tough with no arms. Lawrence Singleton's vow to finish Mary off was an empty threat, but he sure wasn't done being a plague on the earth, because in 1987, he was paroled after only eight years for repeatedly raping a teenage girl, brutally hacking off half of her limbs, and throwing her off a cliff to die. Eight years. When word got out that he was being released, People all over the nation were outraged, especially Californians. So when the prison attempted to parole him, communities all over California either sued to keep him out or resorted to mob justice. In Rodeo, California, Singleton had to be rescued by the cops from a mob of 500 people that surrounded his house demanding blood. The only place that Lawrence was going to be safe was in prison. So with the governor's approval, he moved into a trailer on the San Quentin prison grounds. Mary took him to civil court and won a $2.4 million judgment, but that was really just a symbolic victory because she would never be paid. After a year of living in the trailer, Lawrence figured things had probably died down a little, so he moved out to Tampa, Florida to stay with his brother. But word of the chopper travels fast, Unhappy with Lawrence's presence in their community, some peaceful protester blew a hole in their front lawn with a homemade bomb to send a message. Nobody wants him here. The police looked into the bombing, but not one person in the neighborhood came forward saying they saw or heard anything. Wonder why. Lawrence Singleton was a stubborn old sack of shit and he refused to leave. He stayed in Tampa, Florida committing petty crimes for years until 1997. Singleton hated himself as much as anybody else hated him, so he tried to kill himself. Unfortunately for everyone involved, he was as bad at that as he was at killing Mary Vincent. So after being released from the hospital, he went searching for a hooker to kill. Roxanne Hayes 
31-year-old mother of three, would be the unlucky sex worker. He took her back to his house, and he stabbed her to death without wasting any time. He must have forgotten he had a painter coming by that day to put a fresh coat on his new house, or he just didn't care, because the worker saw Lawrence covered in blood standing over the woman's corpse, and he called the police. Lawrence Singleton was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Just a year later, he was sentenced to death for the murder of Roxy Hayes. But the wheels of justice move slowly, and cancer spreads pretty quick. His body devoured itself from within, and he died alone on a prison cell floor in late 2001. And the world was better off for it. <laughs>